Hello, my name is Mark Mandarano, and I'm the director of instrumental music at McAllister. And I'm really delighted today to talk about the Medea project that we uh, completed in 2017. It was February 2017 when those performances took place. Um, how did it come about? Wow. Um, like with anything artistic, there's no easy answer to those kinds of things. So the one thing to be clear about is that Medea, as we did it, was not a kind of existing project. It's not something that we could say, oh, we've seen this done elsewhere before. Here's a DVD. Let's do our version of that. It was something that was wholly original that didn't exist before. And... Um, I can, I can think I can safely claim that it was my brainchild, and that's not to just claim credit away from anyone else because it was a collaboration. Uh, but I was ruminating um, a bit. We had done together. I, I came here in 2012, and this fabulous space was here waiting for me uh, when I got here in the music department, our, our Mars Concert Hall, which is just a beautiful, acoustically perfect place for everything from a piano or violin sonata up through uh, orchestra and chorus and African drums. It's really a wonderful place to perform. And I'd been delighted to perform here uh, as the conductor of the orchestra. And, um, but there was, there's a tradition also of collaborating in interdisciplinary productions, and I'd been in discussions with Harry Waters and Mike McGeaghy, the director of the choir, um, and many of the other folks over in theater and dance to work on a musical. Uh, this is a tradition here at McAllister, kind of every other year to do a large musical, and we performed Mark Blitzstein's uh, The Cradle Will Rock over in the theater department in, I believe it was the fall of 2014. And it was a wonderful performance. Um, really, I, I was awe-inspired by the talent of the students and the dedication uh, that they had to put into learning their music, tons of lines, choreography, etc. And when that was complete, um, it was going to be time to think about, OK, what next to do? And in the process of doing that, I really was thinking about other types of things to do. Now, there are wonderful musicals out there, and of course, we'll do more in the future. But, you know, there's a, there's a, when you do a musical, when it comes to the instrumental part of it, um, it's, there's a small space in the, uh, in the pit below the stage where you can only fit maybe a dozen people, and it's very crowded. Um, sometimes it needs to be microphone because the acoustics aren't so great. Um, sometimes the writing for the instruments isn't as, as idiomatic as you would like and things like that. So there's some limitations uh, with certain musicals. And so I was thinking, well, we have a big, healthy, robust symphony orchestra here at McAllister, 60 students strong, and they've really risen in, uh, in their abilities and the amount of different kinds of things they can do. Wouldn't it be great to feature, like, to feature that as a part of a theater and dance thing? We don't really get a chance to really feature the whole orchestra, and I think it would be a thrill for the theater and dance people, too, to like, have this enormous resource um, as a part of their production. So that was one thing that was in my mind. The other thing that was in my mind was that we have this amazing space here, and we did lots of concerts here, and lots of recitals of different kinds, and we've had guest artists, but we hadn't really tested it out for something beyond a concert. Like, what, what can we do with the lighting? What can we do with the space? What can we do to transform this into something different? So I was thinking about that as well. And how to put together a symphony orchestra piece with something that's associated with acting or with dance or, or such things. And a lot of things went through my mind. And um, I knew that Back in the 40s, I believe, um, Samuel Barber, a great American composer, very well known for his adagio for strings, that Samuel Barber had composed music in collaboration for a Martha Graham opera, I mean, sorry, a Martha Graham ballet called, uh, it was about the subject matter of Medea. The, the performance that they gave it as a ballet was Cave of the Heart. That's what Martha Graham called it. Uh, but the subject matter that Barbara had in mind was Medea, the 
Greek tragedy. And Martha Graham, one of the supreme artists of the 20th century in any genre, uh, so a real important legacy piece and a great piece of music that I knew that I think was a reach for the McAllister Orchestra, but something we could achieve. So here we had something that was already associated with dance that we could do of our own. And it has this association with Medea, which is a play which would involve acting. And in, in an opera and in a musical, you're probably familiar with this. There's, when the action is happening, there's speech. When new events are happening, there's either speech or in what we call an opera, recitative. But then when the big emotional moments come, someone has a realization, something is transformed within themselves, or the situation on the outside has changed so dramatically that it causes an emo emotional reaction within them, kind of everything comes to a standstill, and there's, that's when they burst out the song. Right? The aria is that emotional high point, which is the musical moment. So there's always been, in things like opera and musical, a kind of seesaw between action and dialogue and such things, and then these realizations where there's a musical high point, where real time kind of pauses for a moment, and the emotional life of the characters takes center stage in a kind of, in a kind of soliloquy. And I thought, suppose we were to take excerpts from the play as speech acted out on the stage, and then intersperse that with the separate sections of the ballet. It would be like the arias, the high points emotionally, that give that emotional resonance, that pause to really let it sink in, together with dance. Um, and we have it go back and forth between these things. And I remember I went down uh, and knocked on Harry Waters Jr.'s, uh, Harry Water Jr.'s um, door, and I had to explain this idea to him, which was a completely, you know, fant fantastical idea at the time. So like, suppose we did this. So he had to sit down and kind of come to terms with what I was trying to talk about, because it was something that had really not been done before. I couldn't point to somewhere else that had done this and say, let's do that. Um, so I said, let's create this together. And I really have to credit everyone over in theater and dance that they not only accepted this challenge, but they took it on and ran with it in ways that were just so mind-blowingly original. I, I was really overpowered by what they came up with in the end. So I can talk a little bit about the collaborative team, um, which was which was wonderful. Um, so Harry um, acted as kind of a overarching producer on the theater side, putting together the team. And one of the first decisions he made was um, was of course that Win Fricky, who's our uh, choreographer and dance instructor here at McAllister, has a background in modern dance, very akin to the Martha Graham tradition. And so this was a natural fit there, really welcome idea to come up with the original choreography to this something in that tradition. Um, and he, um, we had Tom Barrett as the set designer and lighting designer. Um, we had our costumes, et cetera. And he brought in a guest director, Barbara Berlowitz, who uh, kind of specializes in these uh, innovating within these classical traditions um, and had done Medea you know, several times. And she had wonderful ideas about what choices, what scenes from the, op from the uh, I'm gonna say opera because I'm just used to that. So what scenes from the play needed to be chosen, how they could be choreographed, and then how to use the space. So we spent a lot of time in here on this stage figuring out what's going on. And I remember very clearly uh, Tom Barrett and I coming out onto this stage and I set up the orchestra as far back that direction against the wall as I could so that I could leave space out here for the dancers and the actors. And so with empty chairs, I set up every chair of the orchestra with stands and what we needed and percussion and spaces. And we, we pushed it back as far as we could. And then he measured very carefully what, we, what, what space remained here. And I had in my mind, I thought they were just gonna have like maybe a platform or maybe a partial platform here. I thought it was gonna be very kind of, um, very bare bones and simple. 
And what Tom came up with was so, so far beyond what I had imagined, where he built a whole raked stage on several levels that went out over the first level of the audience. And then they used everything around the corners and there were these diagonal holes, I guess you could call them, that were going through this, that carved up the space in different ways and created different areas. And there was room to go underneath. Uh, some of the dancers came out from underneath this part. It was really incredible um, to see that. I had no idea that's where it was all going, but they built that with students. Uh, you know, hammers and nails and saws over there in, <laughs> in the theater construction saw shop. And ingeniously built it so that it could be brought over here and built. And we took over this space for about two to three weeks, I think, um, taking care of putting this all together and then rehearsing and getting used to the space, orchestra rehearsing here you know, with the stage in front of it, then bringing in dancers into our rehearsals in the hall there, uh, recording our rehearsals so that the dancers could listen to it over in their space. And so piece by piece, it came together. Um, with these gorgeous costumes and incredibly powerful choreography. I can't imagine the hours that those students put into the choreography because it was uh, superbly um, commanding and, and seamless, uh, the way they commanded the stage. Um, Then there's the story of Medea. Um, so it features Medea, the woman, the mother, the wife and mo the wife and lover of Jason. And when I initially proposed this idea, it was tw maybe 2015. And one of the things that was happening around then was the the hashtag Me Too movement was was just about starting around that time and this recognition of abuses, of, uh, of harassment, of uh, a kind of an ongoing culture of uh, in an inadequate response by society to, uh, to this ongoing problem. And um, wow, this way this story melded itself, the story of Medea melded itself with that moment over time was something we, I think, just had a hint of when we started and the more we dug into it, the more we realized we're telling a 3,000 year old story that is perhaps more relevant now than it ever has been. Um, the story of Medea who uh, was a kind of a, kind of a goddess but also sacrificed her status in order to pair, partner with Jason. She saved and rescued Jason, but in the process um, relinquished her homeland, relinquished her family, relinquished her status and became associated with Jason so that together as partners, they could have, uh, they could have something together, build together, including a family. And then Jason betrayed that when Medea was displaced so that she became dependent upon him and vulnerable. And in addition to that, she was also a refugee, really, um, out of her own homeland in a strange place and had her protections stripped from her and from her children while she was in this place. Not distant. A stranger is easily misunderstood, but happiness is deceiving. When the sun shines, it wipes away the clarity of the stars. All is annihilated. I have disappeared. The man who is everything to me, he knows it well, has become the vilest of men. My husband. Ah! My friend, this is your city, your home. But I forsaken with neither mother nor brother nor family with whom I might take refuge. I am wronged, betrayed by a husband who brought me to live in exile here in this foreign place. I ask only one thing. If I discover a way to punish my husband for his crimes, keep silent. I will. 
You are right to seek retribution. Your cause is great. Creon, why has the king come here? Medea, you are to be driven and in exile from... we lived through the whole campaign of 2016 and this performance came about in 2017. So it was very timely to see this story um, being told about uh, simultaneously when we had concerns about immigration and refugees in our, in our own country. Um, so this tale humanized that in such a way and the actors really pr projected that in a way it was terrifyingly moving um, to see. Highlights for me were, of course, I mean, I have to acknowledge the efforts of the McAllister Orchestra. I mean, they really, this is a challenging piece of music. It's a mid 20th century piece by an American composer. Um, it's long, um, it's half an hour of, of solid music that's in mixed meters and in, in quasi atonal, um, really expanded vocabulary. Um, very, very, very difficult, and wow, they really rose to the challenge and played it with panache and energy and depth that I was really proud of. Um, and uh, they gave their all and were really thrilled to have the collaboration. Um, even though if you look at the video, you see them kind of in the dark in the back of the stage, just bear in mind like how many musicians are collaborating together and how much work that took for the individual parts and then all to, to make it work together. We worked on it for a whole semester in the fall and then um, worked on more in January and February to make that come together. So I'm very, very proud of that. But I'm also proud of my colleagues on the faculty and on the staff in theater and dance. And of course, the support I had from the music department and from the college, I mean, teams of people came together to make this happen, which is really what a liberal arts college is all about, right? Is that you come here to, yes, focus on a major, right? Think about career, but also to expand your knowledge of everything else that's going on in your world so that you come out with an understanding of how society fits together and what history is and what culture is, the culture you come from, the culture other people come from. And this was a kind of a melting pot place for everyone to bring a little bit of their own personality into a incredible group project. Um, so it was really fulfilling on that kind of deeply educational level um, and a level of achievement, level of striving for excellence and for understanding and for a mutual uh, to feel something together with someone else at the same time um, in a way that's beyond words was really, really strong. Um, yes, I'm very grateful to my, my colleagues and to the students over at uh, Theatre and Dance who came along for this ride and really embraced it and made it their own ride in the end. Um, and this is the, the kind of thing that we I will continue to do where someone will come to me with an idea and say, hey, how about this? It'll be something maybe I don't understand at first, but because I trust them, because I know they're fine artists and they have such integrity, I'm happy to go along and develop my further understanding, which helps me grow and um, to know that they're receptive as well um, in doing these kind of things with us here in music is, is really a gratifying thing and helps me continue to explore.